Hello everybody and welcome to our webinar today, Clearing the Air on Vaping. My name is Jenny Pearson. I'm an Education Officer for the Primary Health Network. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website in our education calendar. Um, if you can, I've got you all on mute, but please type in any questions that you have in the question box. Before we do go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on today and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. I'm coming to you from Enawan land in the beautiful Northern Tablelands. Uh, we have Dr. Krista Monkhouse and Dr. Simon Holliday with us today. Simon is a GP from Shoal Bay and is also an addiction physician. Simon is facilitating um, today's session, so I'll hand over to him. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, I'm at, um, actually, I'm at Tari. But um, I was worked uh, 22 years with the uh, Hunter New England Drug and Alcohol Team and uh, had the pleasure of working with uh, Dr. Krista Monkhouse. And uh, Krista is a paediatrician uh, working in Newcastle in, um, as a staff specialist also in private practice. And she runs the uh, Youth Drug and Alcohol uh, and Family Hunter New England uh, team. And um, well before the rest of the drug and alcohol uh, staff specialists identified uh, the problem, Krista was calling out for us to, to tr try to understand what was happening with this tsunami of vaping that we were seeing. And uh, she, she was seeing it more in her uh, paediatric and adolescent clinics than uh, the other uh, people were. And uh, this is why um, she was really uh, prompted us all to think a lot more about and try to understand a little bit more. So without any more ado, I'll hand over to Krista. Thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you, Simon. Um, I would just also like to acknowledge the land I'm coming from today, the Awabakal people, um, and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the lands and waters in which we all work, live and learn. Today, I'm going to speak um, mainly from the youth and adolescent perspective, as Simon alluded to. Uh, but I think a lot of our learnings now do um, cover uh, the information we need to treat patients um, uh, across the age ranges. So I hope that everyone here um, can get some answers to some of your questions that you may have. We're going to look at the statistics and, and what's led us to where we are today. Um, talk quickly about what electronic nicotine delivery systems are and, and what's um, involved in the composition of them, including flavors and the safeties and harms associated with the um, products within the vapes and what physical and mental health effects they're having. Uh, a quick case vignette, of course, of an adolescent uh, to help look at um, some specific tips and tricks for assessing and supporting uh, someone who wants to quit e-cigarettes. And then we'll touch on what the latest regulations are and, and show you where to get some more training support um, and further guidelines. This poster was um, one that was developed by a young person in a school in Western Sydney after a group of physicians and researchers went in to talk to the young people and say, what's going on with vaping? Where is the problem? What can we do to help? What do you know about it? Um, and, you know, use young people's voices to co-design assessment and intervention tools. Uh, I thought they got quite uh, clever with some of the new flavors they came up with. So you may have all seen headlines like this in the newspapers over the last couple of years. And are they sensationalized headlines or is this truly what is is and has been happening in the youth landscape we recently have had new data come out now that the national drug strategy household survey has completed and been analyzed and we're looking at uh, the survey that occurs approximately every three years slightly delayed because of covid but we see here from 2016 through to 2019, 
through to 2022, 20, 23, in the young people's age group specifically, we're seeing this incredible rise in the use of e-cigarettes. This graph particularly is looking at uh, young people or people using within the, la the last month. So fairly regular use up to daily use. Uh, and we see here in the 14 to 17 year age range, it went from one in 100 uh, young people using regularly to one in 10. Similarly, we have from one in five 18 to 24 year olds um, up to um, one, sorry, one in five are now vaping regularly. Uh, but we see the significant increase in all of the age ranges. This graph shows us a, the picture of um, tobacco and nicotine use, whether it's in a typical cigarette, whether it's in an e-cigarette only, or whether dual use, which is the blacker region, um, what is the percentage in the population uh, of tobacco and or nicotine use? And you can see from 2016, we had about 12, 13% of the population using some form of tobacco and or nicotine. And now as the use of e-cigarettes has increased dramatically, we now have over 20% of young people aged 15 to 24 using a form of tobacco or nicotine within the last month. It's a rise of about 8% over the last um, seven years. What kind of effects are these having on our young people? Um, a number of uh, surveys and reviews were done, uh, mostly in these stats are from 2021. The Truth Initiative um, was a mental health uh, survey that was uh, sent out and looked at the fact that people reported, young people reported using e-cigarettes as a way to decrease stress, anxiety, or depression but then noted further down in the survey that the most common reason for continuing to use the e-cigarettes is because they're feeling anxious, stressed, or depressed. And I guess that begs the question, is that a, with, a symptom of a withdrawal, um, withdrawal signs and symptoms that are occurring with a dependence, or um, was this mental health uh, that had commenced prior to the use of the e-cigarettes? What we do know from ongoing studies and systematic reviews that we have seen an uptick and certainly a swing um, in those that did not describe mental health difficulties prior to vaping um, and certainly now have an association with greater mental health problems. Why have they taken up vaping other than what we've just mentioned and that some people thought they were using it to reduce their mental health load? But many say they're curious, they taste good, they're not very harmful. Um, for young people, it, it's a lesser amount that are using it to quit smoking or reduce smoking, but that it's cheaper and more acceptable than cigarettes. And of course, we can't forget the impact of social media. And though there are uh, regulations in place for some of the big social media brands that they can't have advertising of e-cigarettes to young people. It doesn't stop personal um, ads and personal blogs, uh, personal stories for being posted. And of course, people follow and like, and, and so you get this um, intrinsic following of um, e-cigarette use looking cool uh, suggesting tricks and, um, you know, just marketing towards young people. So the WHO uh, published this report on the global tobacco epidemic in 2023 and said this about electronic nicotine delivery systems. Ends are addictive and harmful, particularly for young people. Ends marketing is targeted at young people and ends undermine tobacco control progress and threaten smoke-free environments. They've encouraged countries to ban the sale of ends to minors. And at this stage, 
at the end of 2023, only 45% of countries had done that completely as of, as of the end of 2023. So just briefly, what are ENDS? Most people will already know this, but um, then there's a variety of um, electronic nicotine delivery systems that have evolved over the years. Uh, but these days, most are using disposable uh, or slick modifiable or refillable puff bars. And it's a non-combustible battery operated device that heats liquid and produces a vapor when it's inhaled. So if looking here on the screen, you can see the evolution of many of these older type of end systems. But now most of uh, most young people, uh, the younger population will now just talk about a puff bar or a vape um, and are referring to items such as these. Hit, puff, draw, drag, any of these um, are, are the words used to describe inhalation from an electronic cigarette or a vape. Um, and look, the pricing is variable depending on who you're getting it from. As we know, it's um, not regulated, so it depends on um, the size, but also did it come from overseas in a bulk shipment? Is it something that um, you're buying at the local store? Other products that are out there um, are heat not burn combustible tobacco products. So as it says in the name, there is tobacco in these, but they don't, um, they don't have to be lit. And then smokeless tobacco snus, which has been around for many years and has been prohibited since 1991. But I put this um, to compare it to a much newer product called Zin, which is a synthetic nicotine um, that is does not have any tobacco in it, but is, is uh, produced to be used essentially the same way as snus, where you're putting it in your mouth um, and placing it against the gums to have the nicotine absorbed across the buccal membranes. This is not registered with the Therapeutic Goods Act and it's nicotine, so classified as a poison, uh, regulated under the poison schedule, but certainly a, a product that is coming up and about. And just as Simon mentioned, um, we started to hear from the young people about vapes and e-cigarettes many years ago now, again, the young people are telling us about Zin and these smokeless nicotine pro products. Briefly, what's in an e-liquid? There's three main components. The solvent, for which the psychoactive agent um, dissolves in. The psychoactive component itself, nicotine or um, has cannabis has been used. And then flavoring compounds, which uh, at this stage, um, well over 8,000 different types of flavors that have been identified in chemical analyses. Um, many of those, we know well how the kinds of effects they have on our gut, um, and some we know that have effects when inhaled, but many we don't know these, the full effect, um, and certainly not when they're heated. Fruit flavors appear to be the most popular, and I will tell you more about that and why. In the aerosols, we um, have analyzed obviously nicotine, even in those that report that they are not containing nicotine. There's acids and alkalines, obviously, from, and there's ultrafine particles, organic compounds, cancer-causing chemicals, heavy metals. In fact, um, recent, a recent paper, um, published showed that youth who were more frequent vapors had higher urine, lead, and uranium levels than those that weren't vaping. Um, so variety of heavy metals uh, proven to be in the, in the aerosols and other, other poisons, nail polish remover, rat poison, so on and so forth. This uh, analysis of 65 e-liquids was done by Lark Holm, who's a respiratory physiologist in Perth. He looked at, at he, he just confiscated or took um, e-liquids from regular shops 
um, off the street or ordered and or ordered some off the web and then measured this random sample of e-cigarette liquids found that the levels of the solvent so the propylene glycol and the glycerol often diverged from what was recorded on the e-liquid label and that there were many many potentially harmful chemicals in these and what he said in his paper was that though they might be safe enough to put in your biscuits or some of them are in things like your cosmetic soaps and shampoos they haven't been tested in terms of what happens when you heat them to 250 degrees and breathe them into your lungs. So we do know that benzaldehyde and cinnamaldehyde, which are two chemicals that he found in these samples that he tested, had already been banned in Australia because they were known to have significantly harmful effects um, when inhaled. Uh, benzaldehyde having that almond cherry flavor is an inhalational irritant which reduces a person's ability to fight off lung infections and transcinamaldehyde has even more severe severe effects on the immune cells in the lung suppressing bronchial airway epithelial cells ciliary motility and mitochondrial function we then look at flavors that are quite popular in, in our young people um, today Green apple is one that comes up a lot and other fruit, fruit based flavor. This was in a mice model uh, completed in 2020. And the researchers were looking at whether different flavors increased the likelihood of the mice to press a buzzer to release an e-liquid. Now, one of those e-liquids had no nicotine in it, but those that had flavors such as menthol and green apple in um, increased the likelihood of those mice pressing that. So indicating that um, high dependence was sought with those uh, that used flavors and it, not the nicotine as much as the flavors. And so further to that, uh, a study was done to look at what the flavor actually does um, to the brains and the neurons. And they found the green apple upregulates nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and the, on the ventral dopamine neurons as well as altering midbrain dopamine and GABA neuron function. Other health risks we, um, many of you will be well aware of already, um, as mentioned, there's serious lung disease that vaping has been linked to not only um, secondary to the flavors and the harmful effects of the actual chemicals that are being vaped in, but we've probably all heard of Evoli, the e-cigarette or vaping product associated lung injury. Um, that made significant headlines in the US um, in 2019 and 2020 there was over 2,800 people hospitalized and 68 deaths uh, secondary to that lung injury. They found that most of those cases were associated with THC containing products, but not all. Some were just nicotine only, but vitamin E acetate seemed to be the common thread. We have had several cases in Australian young people admitted to ICU for oxygen therapy and respiratory support secondary to vaping injuries. There's been a small case series as well in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at patients with small airway centered fibrosis due to e-cigarette use. Um, these patients had a three to eight year history of e-cigarette use and it was noted that they had partial reversal of disease in those who ceased vaping. We also know that nicotine rewires the brain. It changes the way brain synapses are formed in young people, um, which can lead to impaired attention, learning and memory, as well as changes to mood. So for young people and a developing brain, we're um, continuing to press and inform uh, people and their parents, young people and their parents, about the harms and the poison that nicotine causes on the developing brain. There's also the acute intoxication of nicotine, which young people refer to as being nick sick. And this presents when you have too, too much nicotine in the system. 
um, and can be from throat irritation, can present as throat irritation and cough, dizziness, headache and nausea, then vomiting, getting more serious chest pains, arrhythmias, seizures, and obviously uh, the lung injury associated. So um, Nixic, thankfully, in one way, nicotine is a short, act, a fairly short acting substance. So if a young person is starting to feel some of these symptoms, they can simply put down the vape and stop using. But if um, this was an ingestion of an e-liquid, uh, then obviously quite a significant concern and harm and um, they need to be informed to call poisons control and or go to the hospital. This leads us to the concerns we have for our young children. Uh, since 2020, there was a significant number of increasing calls to the Poisons Information Center. Uh, with regards to poison in kids under age five that were either drinking e-liquid nicotine, e-liquid fluid, because it's a odorless and clear um, liquid that had not been stored away safely and appropriately, um, and also just puffing on e-cigarette devices because of the ease of use, uh, the attractiveness of the colors and the smell uh, and also seeing the modeling from the parents and older siblings who might leave their uh, e-cigarette lying around. So important to reinforce key messages around safety for young children. Thought we might meet Blaze, a 16 year old um, male. Uh, he's come in to the clinic today wanting to quit vaping he talks about finishing his puff bar in about um, five days and he has been vaping since he's 13 years old. He also um, uses some pot and, and uses spin, which is tobacco, uh, chopped up and, and mixed up with the cannabis when he packs it in his bong. And this is fairly common that we have uh, polysubstance users um, and they're using more than just one substance at a time. So where to start with Blaze? Uh, we want to know just how dependent he is. So if you don't have much time and this is, um, you want to ask just one question to get an idea of how dependent uh, someone might be on their vape, time to first vape is a really useful question. And if they're vaping within 30 minutes of waking, you can be rest assured they're fairly, there's quite a significant dependence there. It's also important to ask them if they, if they vape overnight. So many of our young people sleep with the vape under their pillow, in their hand, on the bedside. Uh, and recently I had one young person tell me that he vape sleeps. Uh, he, he didn't even realize that he was puffing in the middle of the night when his partner noticed it. To become a little bit more objective, you can fill out the MHONC, which is the Modified hook on, Hooked on Nicotine Checklist. And basically, the more, um, the more yeses that you get um, reflects the degree of dependence. Um, so it's, yes, it's subjective, but some of these can just help, um, help both you and the young person uh, facilitate more conversation around um, understanding why uh, it's hard to quit or what withdrawal uh, cravings and withdrawal symptoms are. So some of those questions would be like, what brand are you using? What type of e-cigarette are you using? Is there a particular flavor you like? And I, I think that's important because that helps me when I'm uh, advising recommend, and providing recommendations around nicotine replacement therapy. Um, if they prefer fruity flavors, then I try to uh, advise them to get fruity flavored uh, um, gum rather than uh, a menthol or tobacco flavor. And then really spelling out, um, particularly for young people, what withdrawal symptoms might be and what they are looking, what we're talking about when we ask about withdrawal symptoms. Unfortunately, I've met a number of young people who experience a lot of those symptoms in our withdrawal 
category, but feel that that's just their normal uh, personality. So a lot of young people will just describe poor concentration, irritability, anxiety, uh, and nausea as everyday occurrence for them without associating that with actually being something that's occurring secondary to nicotine withdrawal. And when I describe, are you in 30 minutes-ish starting to feel some of these symptoms and do some of these symptoms go away when you have a puff on your vape, that helps them begin to put that association together and tease out which symptoms maybe weren't there prior to them becoming more dependent on the e-cigarette. So back to Blaze, he talks about um, using a 5,000 puff bar, which lasts about 10 days on average. He really likes his kiwi passion fruit uh, puff bar, and he occasionally shares it around with friends, and that's another harm minimization message you want to get out there because we do see some occurrence of HSV getting around and obviously any other um, infectious disease, respiratory disease passed around. But we need to assess uh, approximately the amount of nicotine that uh, this young man might be consuming or inhaling and absorbing. And the way that we're doing this nowadays um, to our best guesstimates is it's been suggested that 20 cigarettes, which each cigarette, though it contains seven to eight milligrams of nicotine, only one milligram of nicotine is generally absorbed from a cigarette. So 20 cigarettes, which is 20 milligrams of nicotine, is approximate to 300 puffs. Now, that is not a perfect science. It's going to depend on how um, long, how deep someone inhales, puffs, drags, um, and uh, various other factors. However, this is the best um, that we are working with at, at this moment in time. And that's why using those other markers of dependency, trying to work out just how quickly they vape when they wake up and um, will help, again, guide our recommendations. But if Blaze is using a 5,000 puff bar over 10 days, he has 500 puffs per day, that's nearly two backpacks per day of cigarettes. So we're, we're getting um, upwards of 40 cigarettes, 40 milligrams of nicotine per day. He talks about his time to first vape being immediate um, and sleeping with it under his pillow. He takes it to school with him and, and can't get through a day without it. His grades are now slipping. He's been suspended for vaping in the bathroom. And he actually quit footy because he's been getting puffed and doesn't feel like he can keep up with his team. He did try to quit last year because of uh, some of those things and unfortunately wasn't successful um, and is feeling really down about all of that um, and is starting to do less and less with his mates. So we just have a quick chat with him about where, you know, how ready is he to change? Uh, and he he's actually made some decisions. He, he's ready. He's ready to do something about this because um, of where he's at now. And and as, a, as said already, he's um, finding it difficult to do well at the school. His exercise capacity has decreased um, and he was really sick with COVID recently. And, and we've talked about some of the impacts that his e-cigarettes could have contributed to with that. So this is a quick plan that you can provide to a young person and, and go through with them um, what their goals are. As he said, he uh, wants to be able to do better at school and maybe increase his exercise capacity again. And, and then talk, give him some, a few behavioral strategies to avoid some of those cravings, like drinking a glass of water when he gets the urge to have a vape. Cold shower, high intensity exercise for a minute helps increase and release dopamine um, in place of that uh, puff. And don't feed the cat. I'm sure many of you have heard of the stray cat analogy. Uh, the more we keep feeding that urge, the cat, the urge, the craving is going to keep coming back. We need to 
break down that pathway, break down that cycle, stop feeding the cat. So the craving and the urge has a chance, we have a chance to reset those pathways, break those neuro, um, neural pathways and retrain them. He also needs to think about his triggers. Um, what, what kind of situations is he in uh, when he does feel like vaping? So removing vaping paraphernalia from his room, um, from his person, I uh, suggest when kids go to bed, putting the vape in a drawer somewhere so it's not sleep under the pillow with them or next to the bedside, making it more difficult for them to use overnight or first thing in the morning. Telling your friends you have quit, making yourself accountable and possibly not hanging out with the people that you normally vape with or in the same um, situations. Here's a few other um, strategies that we uh, hand out, a little handout to our young people. Uh, the one minute quick exercise, I, I ask them, I get, I get them to tell me, what do, you, what do you enjoy doing? Do you like push-ups? Do you like jumping jacks? Do you run on the spot? Um, jelly beans or lollipops, a lot of young people just like having something in their hand. So having a lollipop to um, suck on uh, in, it can be really helpful. Um, and then I always mention again about caffeine and um, making sure they have their intake of caffeine while they're re reducing their nicotine. Um, I do see a number of young people, uh, in my clinic at least, because we're, we do see the moderate to severe side that are on atypical um, antipsychotics and olanzapine in particular is known for um, being metabolized in that same pathway. So we have to make sure that um, they reduce their lanzapine as their nicotine comes down, otherwise they become quite sedated. Urge surfing is a great way to speak to young people who enjoy water uh, or enjoy surfing, to talk to them about, um, again, riding that urge up to the peak. But as soon as that they've reached the peak, they've already won the battle because um, they're gonna come down the other side. And um, for those that associate alcohol and uh, cigarette use or vaping use, uh, important to reduce that. So I talk about nicotine replacement therapy um, with young people and families as a form of harm reduction because um, some parents, if they're involved with the care of the young person, um, and some young people worry about taking, having more nicotine on board because we're telling them that nicotine is a poison and we should be stopping it, reducing it. But um, obviously nicotine replacement therapy uh, patch, by putting that patch on topically, it's, just, it's something that is can be used as a harm reduction tool because you're now not inhaling all of the various chemicals and poisons that we've um, just discussed. It also slow absorption and puts you into a steady state um, of nicotine levels for the day to, to reduce the cravings and urges and decrease irritability and mood swings, which um, many adolescents really like hearing that they won't have to feel the, uh, the mood swings throughout the day. Um, we recommend, uh, at least for young people, um, to try the, particularly for those that are vaping overnight or vaping first thing in the morning, to consider a 24 hour um, maintenance patch if they can tolerate it. And really, I know a lot of young people say that they don't like um, patches and nicotine replacement therapy and or they've tried it in the past and it wasn't helpful. Um, I guess I would just say that some of my thoughts around that is to, it's worth spending that little bit of extra time to prepare them for the possible side effects, prepare them for the possibly bad dreams or the difficulty for it sticking or with the gum, you know, possibly that their throat's going to feel like it's burning a little bit and making sure that they really know how to use it appropriately. In fact, I often get give them a piece of gum in clinic and watch them chew it and park it um, in the office and let them experience the tingling taste and whether they like the fruit flavor or the mint flavor and, and sort of troubleshoot it with them there before they even leave the office. Um, and then um, offer them to 
to you know troubleshoot things down the road if it's not working you know please come back and we'll we'll find something that works better if it's if it's too much if it's too less if you're feeling nick sick you can cut the patch in half you know so there's give them lots of options to to manage it um i give them this as well uh, so that they have in writing some of those um, directions and those side effects and how to deal with those side effects um, as such as the patches falling off or having irritation of the mouth or throat with the oral products. Um, also before leaving, um, we try to hook them up with longer term support. So um, now young people have, we, we've been asking young people, uh, um, Cancer Council specifically has been doing a lot of surveying and, and talking to young people um, about what type of supports they would like and benefit from. And most of them say not talking to a counselor on a phone. So they are trying desperately to get um, various apps and text services and web services up and running to support young people. Uh, the I Can Quit is a website that uh, anyone can sign up for online and then um, it has a, a number of interactive um, items like such as a, um, a savings calculator and um, tracking app. It is mainly initially for sm um, quitting cigarette smoking but um, it's evolving as we speak. And then there's the Aboriginal specific um, quit line and yarn line that young people and old people can access. So what happened with Blaze? Uh, we set a quit date. He logged onto the I Can Quit website, was provided with a number of CBD strategies that were individualized for him and commenced nicotine replacement therapy. Uh, he had weekly follow up with a support team at Headspace. Um, which various headspaces um, can offer various um, supports as some do can um, see young people in like an AOD counseling role and some will see them under um, in the general clinics. This, um, this article came out at the end of last year um, from The Guardian saying that uh, we need to intervene. The, the window is closing rapidly to prevent teenagers developing nicotine addiction and other health issues. Um, and in the background, the New South Wales government has been working hard um, since 2021, 2022, and 2023, this announcement came with regards to youth vaping, 234 million um, directed towards it, one of those things being a uh, major educational campaign aimed for youth, other um, areas being changes to regulations and ongoing compliance and enforcement. So this Every Vape is a Hit to Your Health um, is the campaign that hopefully most of you have seen. And if you haven't, here's some links to look at the videos. The YouTube here has videos from, um, it was, this was the whole campaign was co-designed with youth and they said young people said we want to hear from real people who have experienced harms from vaping we want to hear from experts in the field and so the videos that are up on youtube are just that um, our pediatric respiratory physician um, is on there talking about the harms of vaping on the lungs and then there's young people like this man here who's um, been admitted for respiratory disease those kids with burns and um, then there's the resources hub for health professionals, for schools, um, teachers, and for parents, carers, and young people. And then more um, facts and information about vaping. The, some of the recent changes in 2024, um, both January 1st and March 1st, we've had some changes to the regulations. So ban on importation of disposable single-use vapes. Uh, so that's even if they have a prescription, as consumers cannot import vapes for personal use despite having a prescription. Um, 
and no one can import non-therapeutic vapes anymore. For those that are importing therapeutic vapes, they have there's a requirement to have to notify the TGA of product compliance and obtain a license and permit. There's new quantity limits under the traveler's exemption um, for vapes brought into the country by person. So that's um, someone who is using a vape um, with a prescription um, for treatment or someone that traveler is some is caring for someone who has prescribed vapes. They're only allowed to bring in two vapes at a time, uh, 20 vape accessories and 200 mils of the e-liquid. And then uh, there's been a, an extra pathway to hopefully make prescribing vapes, uh, therapeutic vapes, uh, slightly easier. And there's a link there for further information, but I will go into that uh, momentarily. Just a quick a note on compliance and enforcement. Uh, New South Wales Health has been trying to increase and improve their illicit tobacco uh, and nicotine compliance and enforcement programs. So they conduct many thousands of inspections, seize over hundreds of thousands of cigarettes and e-liquids and worth up to $13.7 million and seizing cigarettes and 1,700 kilograms of illegal tobacco products and have successfully prosecuted over 25 retailers. This is a tricky area, um, an ongoing area of work to increase um, border controls. Further phases with regards to regulating vaping is throughout um, 2024, they're hoping to um, strengthen the product standards for the therapeutic vapes by limiting flavors further, reducing nicotine concentrations and requiring pharmaceutical packaging on all therapeutic vapes. So um, just briefly, I'll mention the various um, schemes to, uh, to prescribe therapeutic vapes where necessary. Um, and there's guidelines that um, you can see in the link here um, that RICGP is just currently updating. Um, what we have so far is prescribers need to consider what nicotine concentration and type of product is appropriate for a particular person's needs relating to smoking cessation or management of nicotine dependence. That the risks associated with prescribing therapeutic vapes need to be considered in the context of the seriousness of the risk of continued smoking or vaping. And that a risk benefit analysis should be done before prescribing therapeutic vapes to your patients. And for adolescents, under 18 years of age, non-vaping um, products are not currently nicotine vaping products are not currently re recommended as a smoking cessation aid. Um, there's been no studies of effectiveness and safety in this age group. So these schemes, I'm sure, are familiar to um, all of you, but the Special Access Scheme C is the one which has just come into effect as of January 1st, 2024. Um, and the differences now, I think I haven't had to use these, um, seeing that I only prescribe to under 18. Um, so Simon might um, be able to answer any more questions about that. But this um, scheme, what I see here is that um, it allows a nurse practitioner as well to use the online notification system so that when um, you, the, you get the approval number, the person can um, go to the pharmacy and have that number immediately. And that if the actual form that needs to be filled out doesn't have to go in um, until after the fact and, and within 28 days of that product, um, the pharmacist can even submit the form on behalf of the prescriber. So I think just it's trying to streamline um, the prescribing there a little bit more um, compared to the special access scheme B, which is same thing applying online to, for approval for a single patient and they have to reapply for each patient. Whereas your authorized prescriber scheme allows you to apply online for an authority to prescribe non nicotine vaping products for all patients under your care. But every six months you have to so you have to keep records and every six months you have to report to the TGA the number of patients for whom you prescribed. 
There's also, I wanted to draw your attention to uh, some new community health pathways that have been localized from other regions um, for Hunter New England um, and login details for the Central Coast. We now have a vaping and youth clinical pathway, um, thanks to our other uh, health districts um, that had commenced with this work. And when you go to child and youth health and drop down to drug and alcohol, child and youth, you'll find a vaping and youth um, pathway, background information, assessment, management, everything that we really have discussed about today and um, ongoing assessment and treatment um, with referral options all on links here on your community health pathways. And at the end, um, referrals, this is my service, WIDAX, and I'll just mention that we don't take nicotine only referrals. Um, we do tend to see those with a moderate to severe substance use, so those with poly substance use um, by all means. Um, and those are our details there. So finally, what else is in New South Wales Health doing to improve uh, treatment and supports for uh, people with e-cigarette use and wanting to cease? There are enhancements and ongoing optimization. The quit line um, is looking at rolling out a mobile app and SMS program by the end of this year. And there's quite large I can quit enhancements, the website I showed you, that will be rolled out to improve not only for smoking, but for vaping reduction and cessation as well. So um, they look like quite quick turnaround times, but Cancer Council has been doing an incredible job um, moving quite swiftly on getting the, um, the promotional um, packages out and updating these because they're really committed to um, addressing this crisis of vaping in youth. Last but not least, um, where can you get um, more support and more learnings? Uh, our ACGP link, there's been a um, webinar and a podcast both. Um, these are just two of the most recent ones that have um, been put up. And there's also a actual program that you can run through a module that the Sydney Children's Hospital Network um, have developed through Kids Quit. And so you can log into that and, and do a module on e-cigarette use and assessments. This guide was put together um, through the Ministry of New South Wales Health with uh, a group, a working party um, that I was part of. And uh, clicking on this link, you can access this whole guide, which goes through in really great detail and gives fantastic tips and um, conversation starters and suggestions on how to support uh, young people, which is up to the age of 25, um, and uh, for re assessment, engagement, rapport, intervention, treatment, and follow-up. I hope um, that is more than enough um, resources and information to guide you to it. Um, I know many of you have been doing this already for a very long time and um, it's um, yeah thank you for all your um, ongoing uh, advocacy in this space to help young people any questions that was wonderful uh, Krista, thank you so much. Um, I um, I was blown away by that information, and, and uh, I've never heard of uh, sleep vaping, um, sleepwalking, night terrors, but vape sleeping is a whole new, just uh, takes it to a whole new level. That was incredible, and um, I, I'm I'm also really grateful for you putting a um, a handle on uh, the number of vapes to cigarettes. I've never come across this. Uh, you know, 200 cigarettes is about 300 puffs. So that was really useful information. Um, I've got a couple of things that um, sort of um, comments or questions, but anybody who's listening, you're welcome to put a question in the, in the uh, question section and we can cover them. Uh, we've got some time left. So um, I've got a couple of things. Um, just a comment, first of all, 
Uh, you said uh, about mental health and uh, vaping and what sort of drives people to vape and to continue vaping. It's often about anxiety. And then we also have seen this with smoking. Um, I saw some very interesting research about 15 to 24 year olds initiating smoking. And often it was associated with first panic attack uh, and uh, depression and suicidal thoughts. And so um, given that we're talking about the same molecule, it's uh, the uh, impact of nicotine on mental health is enormous, isn't it? Uh, and um, so you might want to make some comments about that. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, um, it's interesting. We tread quite carefully to say that, um, you know, that research that has been done in tobacco and typical cigarettes, you know, we sort of have a redoing a lot of that research with just e-cigarettes, you just nicotine, because we want to be clear that it's not the tobacco versus the nicotine that's causing these effects. But I, I mean, we know, we, we see the effects on young people um, that, and we know that nicotine has these, these significant effects. We see young people um, talking about, talking about mental health. I, I, I think what's tricky, I'll just stop myself there. I think what's tricky is to, mental health is such a multifactorial, pathology that it's very um, you can't just link one one item one molecule one factor to young people's mental health so certainly I think um, anyone that is intoxicated or withdrawing from any substance is going to be impacted and uh, there are levels of anxiety um, mood and whatnot um, and it just increases that flame and that fire. Uh, I was interested in uh, you talking about snooze and the, the new um, Zin. I hadn't come across Zin, but I guess we'll be hearing a lot about it. Um, uh, there were a recent presentation by Judy Moller from uh, Wollongong University, who's a medical chemist, and she was uh, talking about uh, new formulations. There's one called pearls, nicotine pearls, and these are sublingual uh, nico pops and uh, mm. another uh, interesting thing is um we're seeing puffers the vapes having more and more um puffs per vape so initially they came out with say 600 now there's a one called a star with 7000 puffs in it yeah yep and and i think that's the thing i would say that is one of the biggest eye openers for the patients I see is when I actually um, give them that comparison of how many cigarettes they're smoking per per puff bar per day because they ha they have n no way of knowing that knowing how to make that association and when they realize that their level of dependence has increased so significantly because they have access to it all the time. There's nothing that stops them. They don't have to be outside. They can sneak it in class. They can have it under the pillow at night. And when they recognize that they actually have just been able to basically suck on this puff bar 24 hours a day, then it's like the light bulb goes off I would never have smoked more than a pack a day or whatever they think is reasonable. And when they realize it's more like two packs a day, it seems to be just sort of that little wake up call that they might need for some. It's just amazing how, how effective the uh, big tobacco push has been to reintroduce nicotine addiction throughout a community, starting with the young, get them young. Hmm. Yeah. And I, I'm not an expert. Sorry. No, you, you go. I was going to say I was recently um, listening to um, an officer, uh, an officer from Queensland who's a uh, works in covert drug operations, 
um, and he's been doing a lot of the compliance and enforcement up in Queensland. And he was actually speaking about the fact that um, Philip Morris is actually now producing some of the therapeutic vape products that they're starting to uh, release into the market, which how's that for ethical, moral um, decision making when you're now having to prescribe therapeutic products that are made by the big tobacco companies? Yeah, that's true. So there's a big marketing push, a big advertising and lobbying push to ban illegal vapes. And that's because the uh, all the legal vapes, they're made by two companies, basically, which is Philip Morris and British America Tobacco Association. And the illegal ones are the ones that are coming in from Malaysia and China uh, and uh, no, no, no brand, no brand. Mm -hmm. My son is a high school teacher and deals with vapes on a daily basis. And uh, I, I pity high school teachers because they've got not a hope. There's a new product called a stealth, uh, stealth system, which um, creates no uh, smoke, no visible action. You can just hold it in your hand. So you lift your hand, hand up to your mouth and have a puff in class. And then also vapes that are coming like um, car lock batteries, uh, highlighter pens, uh, drink bottles, and um, smart watches. So um, I, I think it's a real battle of um, battle of wits, cat and mouse. Yeah, yeah. And um, you just have to uh, put these things into YouTube, and you can get videos on how to hide your vape in class. Um, yeah, there's highlighter pens, you know, as fashion accessories. Um, it, it's a it's a real marketing schema that you know we don't have a hope in um, in get going up against that. Uh, we have to um, unfortunately be there for the young people um, when they do uh, face the, the dependence and the withdrawals and and the effects that they they are experiencing from that. Mm. We're still waiting on um, any questions. So if you've got any questions, please submit them. You're very welcome. I think we've got a couple of minutes left. So I've got one one more um, uh, comment or question, um, Krista. Uh, Judy Moller, the uh, forensic uh, medical um, chemist from Wollongong, she collected 597 vapes that have been confiscated from New South Wales high schools. And uh, she found the ones that were marked non without nicotine very often did have nicotine and the ones that were strong or moderate really it was no bearing to nicotine often the ones who were moderate had extraordinary high levels of nicotine in them um, so the packaging really is no um, guide to nicotine content yeah and and so again that's why um you know they we it just it's all being banned you know because what because of the not having regulations on them, young people were using, oh, anyone was using um, using vapes that they had no idea really what was in them. Um, and even those that felt, uh, thought that they didn't have nicotine in them often did, as you say. Um, so a really dangerous product to have out there. Um, and so now that it's gonna be completely banned, um, from what I understand, those, um, that have prior to um, March 1st, those that had imported and have stocks in their stores under the, what was legal at the time are allowed to sell out those products. So there'll be a, a sh period of time where those products get sold out, but then in a matter of months, we should stop. I, altruistically, we should stop seeing um, vapes being um, imported. Um, excellent. I've got one just uh, harm minimization comment for vaping. Um, Judy Muller was talking about when a vape starts to taste bad, it's often because people are reusing the same coil because it cuts down costs, or it might be they've got extended coil use because there's more puffs. And um, when a vape starts to taste bad, it's often because metal is leaching. So you, while you might be getting 
cadmium and lead and uranium and all the rest of it, um, you're actually going to get accelerated uh, heavy metal exposure once the coil is um, damaged or, or um, um, oxidized. Yeah, that's a great tip that um, we should send that message to all people using vapes. Well, thank you both very much. Um, it's been a very interesting um, talk today. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, there will be a, an evaluation that will pop up. It'll only take about 30 seconds to complete if we could get you to do that. Well, thanks so much, Krista and Simon, and I'll see you all next time. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.